So thanks, Matt, and, and thanks, everybody. It's really wonderful to be here. And I, I particularly want to uh, thank the sophomores that I had a chance to hang out with earlier today. We had a really fun discussion. I want to apologize to them, because uh, uh, some of this is going to be a little repetitive. Um, but I, I want to just sort of tell you a tiny bit about who I am and, and what I do, and then I want to tell you kind of the biggest problem that I'm trying to solve right now. Um, so I teach at probably the weirdest school in the world, um, which is not MIT. I teach at MIT, but I teach in a part of MIT called the MIT Media Lab. And the one rule of the MIT Media Lab is that no two people there can do the same thing. So you have to work on something completely different from everybody else who teaches there. So uh, up there at the top is a friend of mine, Hugh Hare. Uh, he was a champion rock climber until he lost both of his legs below the knee and decided that the best thing that he could work on is prosthetic limbs. So he now does some of the most interesting research in the world uh, around building uh, extremely lightweight, extremely powerful artificial <coughs> limbs. Uh, below Hugh is Neri Oxman. Uh, she's an artist who takes all of her inspiration from nature, from biology. She will take a pattern of cells and blow it up into an architectural structure. Right now she's trying to print buildings out of molten glass by having a robot arm lay them down. Uh, and they share a lab, and they're right next to my lab. Uh, and so are people who are trying to genetically engineer mosquitoes or trying to figure out the future of opera. So it's a super weird, super strange place to work. And then my super strange work doesn't fit with anybody else there because what I do is sort of ask the question, how can we make media and how can making media, how can reporting, how can making films, how can doing photography, how can that change the world in really deep and fundamental ways? And one of the things that I've worked on for the last dozen years or so is this project called Global Voices, which is something that I started when I realized that when I watched TV in the United States, there were whole parts of the world that I never heard anything about. Um, so after Worcester, I went on to college. After college, uh, I did what everybody else does. I moved to West Africa uh, to Ghana. Uh, and I still spend a lot of time in Ghana, and I'll t tell you more about that in a moment. But after spending time working in West Africa, I discovered that I came back to the United States and I couldn't read anything. I couldn't find out anything about what was going on for my friends and for their businesses and for their families and their lives. And I realized that with the internet, people could start writing their own stories. And so I helped start a community which now has about 1,500 people working on it called Global Voices, which is essentially a daily newspaper based out of social media. It says, here's what's going on in Ghana through the lens of, here's what people are writing about on Twitter and on Facebook and on Instagram and Snapchat. Here's what people are talking about within the local community. And we publish it in 30 different languages. You can find the English language version of it, but you can see right next to it uh, the Bengali language version of it. And this is all put together by volunteers all over the world. So I'm a big believer that there are things that you can do today using media, using technology, that were really, really hard to do 40 or 50 years ago. And I'm a big believer that they're changing the world in terms of how we do civic engagement, how we do politics, how we do social change. And this is a really good thing because I want to make the argument to you that sort of social change and politics and sort of engagement with our civic life is in a really interesting sort of crisis. And I realized this crisis a couple of months ago when I was visiting friends in Ghana. I'd gone to do a meeting with a, a, a nonprofit that I help advise, but I also did what I do whenever I travel around the world. I went to a hackerspace. And so this is a photo that I took with some folks who were hanging out in Ghana's leading hacker and maker space. And we ended up having this long conversation about what's going on in Ghanaian politics right now. And I was particularly psyched to meet the dude in the red hat who's sticking his tongue out. And the reason is I've been following this guy on Twitter. I knew who he was. He showed up for my talk. I was really psyched about this. And the reason I was psyched to meet Efo is that he had been involved with one of the most interesting protests that had happened in Ghana in the last couple of years. So the big thing that's going on in Ghana right now, Ghana is a middle-income country. It's not desperately poor. 
It's actually growing very, very quickly. It has a lot of people living in cities. Those people living in cities have a lot of the things that you would want to have living in a city in a very hot place. They have air conditioners, they have televisions, and the problem that they have is that the power keeps going off. And the word that everyone started using for this is dumsor. Dumsor is in the tree language. Dum means on, sor means off, and so dumsor is just on off, on off, and on off. And that's what's happening right now if you live in Ghana. The power keeps going off for 12, 24, 36 hours at a time, and you're in your apartment, and you're, it's you know, 95 degrees outside, and suddenly you don't have power anymore, and this is really pissing people off. And so young people have started this campaign called Dumsor Must Stop. They're getting together, they've got their t-shirts on, they're holding up the kerosene lanterns that they use to read by when the power goes off. They're all going out to this march, and this was a huge march. There were about 5,000 people who got together on the outskirts of Accra, the capital city, marched in to protest to the government and to say, we've got to do something about this, Dumsor must stop. And this guy, Efo Dela, was one of the guys who organized this. And I said, Efo, this is great. So when you're doing political organizing in Ghana, when you're building political movements, is it done on Facebook? Is it done on Twitter? Where is it done? And Efo said to me, oh man, I'm not political. I've got nothing to do with politics. I said, wait a second. You just got 5,000 people out in the street to go protest the government. You're telling me you have nothing to do with politics? You're not political. Now, when people say this, in a lot of the parts of the wor world where I work, it's because they don't want to get arrested. In a lot of the world, it's really dangerous to be political. When I work in Myanmar, no one would ever admit to being political because it's a great way to end up in prison. But that's not what's going on in Ghana. Ghana actually, according to Reporters Without Borders, is more open and free than the United States, at least in terms of press freedom. And generally speaking, is an incredibly high-functioning democratic nation. So what was Enfo's problem when I said, you know, how do you do political organizing? He said, I'm not political. <coughs> he didn't want to be seen as an idiot. What he said to me basically was, politics in this country is so dumb, it's so messed up, that if I'm seen as being political, at least half of the people are going to assume that anything I have to say is not worth listening to. And probably 90% of the people are going to assume that anything I have to say is not worth listening to. And I have so little respect for either of these political parties that I won't even be caught taking a selfie with someone who's a visible member of those parties because everyone will assume that I'm corrupt, that I'm involved with politics, and that I'm not a smart thinker. So politics is so toxic in this country, this free, open country where freedom of speech rules, that this guy wants nothing to do with it. And this isn't just Ghana. I'm finding this all over the place. I go and work with people who are working on really cool projects. Over in India, there's this amazing campaign called uh, I, I Won't Pay, or I Pledge Not to play, Pay a Bribe. And so when people are asked by government officials to pay a bribe, they say, I'm not going to do it anymore, I'm not going to pay for it, and I'm actually going to show that I was asked to pay a bribe. In Nigeria, you've had these giant protests against corruption, people going out into the street. In Russia, people have so little faith in the government to get things done, they've started building their own system to provide aid to each other. So if someone needs aid after a natural disaster, people get together and they crowdsource that aid. They get together and they basically say, let's load up the blankets, let's load up the food, let's do it, let's provide the aid, because the government won't do it. And you talk to any of these people and what they'll say to you is, I'm not involved with politics. I, I have nothing to do with politics. So I want to make the case that this might be happening here, too. Uh, you probably recognize these two angry men. Uh, at the moment, they are probably the most visible and certainly the most interesting, certainly the most covered political candidates within the 2016 election. One of the things that they have in common is both of them will tell you that they have nothing to do with politics as usual. In the case of Donald Trump, that may actually be true. Uh, he's actually quite far from politics as usual. 
Senator Sanders, it's actually rather hard to make that argument. He's been in public service for almost 50 years. Uh, he's been you know, an elected uh, member of the Senate and before that the House of Representatives. But they are both riding this very interesting wave of anti-politics, of people essentially saying, yeah, I want to change the world, I want things to be different, but I don't necessarily believe that this is how this is going to happen. And if you look at this, it's really that we have now taken an incredibly negative view of people who work within politics. If you go out and ask people, how much do you trust people who work in this particular profession to do the right thing most of the time. You get 80% for nurses. You start getting down to lawyers, you get 21%. Used car salespeople, 8%. Members of Congress come up even lower. I do not want to tell you where college professors show up on this. It's not as flattering as nurses. So I, I teach civics, right? I teach about the political process, I teach about social engagement, I teach about social change, I would assume that someone like me standing in front of a room like this is going to tell you that the American system is resilient, we're going to find our way through this, the brilliance of democracy is that we always find our way around these rough patches, but that's not actually what I'm going to tell you. I'm, I'm actually pretty worried at this moment in time. And what I'm worried about is this idea of mistrust. I think what's happening at this moment in time is that Americans, and actually a lot of people around the world, are extremely mistrustful of government, and they're extremely mistrustful of any sort of big institution. So here's a question that the polling firm Pew, and also the polling firm Gallup, have been asking Americans for years and years and years. And the question is very simple. Do you trust the government in Washington to do the right thing all or most of the time? This number peaks in 1964. 77% of people say they trust the government in Washington to do the right thing all or most of the time. During most of your lifetimes, it has been well below 25%. Under Obama, it actually hits single digits briefly. It runs around 13% at the moment. I'm older than most of you in this room, I'm 43. The one time in my life that that number has been above 50%, the one time that a majority of Americans have said they trust the government to do the right thing was right before we invaded Iraq, which just goes to show what we know. <laughs> We've had a massive shift in how people view government. We've gone from people viewing government as something that for the most part is trustworthy and doing good things, to something that most of us don't believe in and don't trust. And the interesting thing is that this hasn't just been about Congress, this hasn't just been about the presidency. If you talk to Americans about most major institutions, they have a very low degree of trust. We've got basically no trust in Congress, you know, single digits. Big business, television news, the criminal justice system, newspapers, banks, public schools, you know, you get up to the presidency and you're, you know, round about 30 odd percent. The medical system, we've dropped enormously our confidence within it. The only institutions in American society that we've increased our trust in are the police and the military and small business. But everything else, people now say, I trust this less than I used to. And it's not just us, actually, when you look at people around the world, you do this survey in different countries, most other countries are experiencing some sort of erosion in trust in government and in big institutions in one fashion or another. Now there's reasons this might happen. Uh, for those of you doing American history, uh, Richard Nixon had something to do with this. But it also had something to do with folks who were in office when I was in school, Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher, um, who basically got up and said, you shouldn't trust governments. Governments don't do the right thing. They're not going to be particularly effective. Some of it may have had to do with personal misbehavior, Bill Clinton, uh, and the trouble that he found himself in. But I actually think that mistrust, in many cases, comes from failure. So for everyone who watched how the US government responded to Hurricane Katrina, and suddenly had this strange moment of the wealthiest nation in the world 
looking like an impoverished developing nation and not capable of taking care of its own people was a really terrifying moment. And for other people, what was really terrifying was discovering that the US economy, the most robust economy in the world, was built on extremely shaky footing. And it was hard to know whether it was ever going to recover, whether we were ever going to have good jobs again. Some of this may have to do with the fact that we're in a different world informationally. That we now have folks like Edward Snowden who are grabbing secret information and making it public and suddenly we're seeing the inner workings of some of these powerful institutions and we're finding out that maybe they're not as smart, maybe they're not as well run as any of us hoped they would be. But here's the problem. We're now at a point where almost everybody agrees that our system of government is not working as well as we would like it to. Some of you may have watched President Obama stand up and give his most recent State of the Union address where he basically said, it could be better, but not until we try to figure out how to fix this. Not until we somehow get to a point where the two parties in power don't hate each other so much that they can't actually get any work done. So here's why I care about this. It bums me out that Congress is so ineffective. It bums me out that only 9% of people think Congress is doing a good job. But that's not really what I care about. What I care about is how to make change in the world. And I'm really interested in trying to make progress on a bunch of different issues. Uh, I care a lot about climate change. I care a lot about equal rights for gays and lesbians. I care a lot about reforming the criminal justice system in the United States. I care a lot about ending structural racism in the United States. <clears throat> On a lot of these issues, the way that we get taught to do civics is that we're supposed to elect good people to Congress. We're supposed to pressure them. We're supposed to tell them what we want as citizens and they're going to act on our behalf and things are going to change. And that's not really what's been happening very much lately. And coming to you guys at a school that has dedicated itself for decades to the idea of loving and serving the world and trying to figure out how to positively impact communities, I would be lying to you if I told you that I thought this was the best way to make change at this moment in time. So once you start saying, well, maybe this doesn't work, this leads you down a much tougher path. Lots of people the last few years have been asking this question of, what happens if you really overthrow the systems that we have? What happens if you have revolution in one fashion or another? We watch the Arab Spring spread throughout North Africa and the Middle East. You watch people look at governments that are much more dysfunctional than ours and essentially say there's no way to fix this. We gotta get these folks out. And at first, I think this was incredibly inspiring and people were very excited. What if suddenly the people of Egypt had a functioning democracy? What if they were no longer controlled by an authoritarian leader? And the problem is for most parts of the Arab world, the Arab Spring actually hasn't been very successful. Egypt is now probably more repressive than it was even under Mubarak. It's almost unimaginable to say that. Many of the other countries that went through the Arab Spring, like Libya, like Yemen, they are now still facing civil war, and particularly in Syria. The only one that's made it out okay is Tunisia. And what we learned is that when you overthrow a government, when you kick those folks out, what happens is the next most powerful people take over. So when Mubarak got kicked out of Egypt, the Muslim Brotherhood, the political movement of, of maybe or maybe not radical Islamists, took over. When the Muslim Brotherhood got kicked out, the army took over. They're the next more powerful. And it turns out that getting rid of someone who is powerful and corrupt and trading it for someone else who's powerful and corrupt is not a particularly good deal. The Occupy movement has found out it's really hard to create a new revolution, a whole new way of doing politics from scratch. And that even if you manage to oust someone who's in power, there's a lot of other people in power who are waiting in line. So for a lot of us who work on social change, we're in this very frustrating place. We had hoped that we could influence institutions. 
But now those institutions, we sort of look at and say, no one believes those guys are going to get anything right. Why would we bother working on that? A lot of people have looked and said, maybe it's time for a revolution. Maybe we have radical change. And that turns out to be, in many cases, very frightening, very disappointing. And so what a lot of people that I work with right now are sort of asking this question, how can I be most effective? If I want to change the world, what can I as an individual do that has the best chance of success? Weirdly enough, when I try to answer this question, I end up looking to this friend of mine who is a law professor, and, and really a computer law professor. This guy's named Larry Lessig. He wrote a book in the year 2000 called Code and Other Laws of Cyberspace. And the book was about this question. How do we govern ourselves in a society? And Lessig said, well, the way that we know how to govern ourselves is we pass laws. We decide something is undesirable. We pass a law. And if you break the law, we put you in prison. Uh, it's not legal to drive 100 miles an hour uh, in front of cameras. And it probably is a lousy idea. And if you get pulled over doing 100 miles an hour, there's a good chance that you're going to end up charged with reckless endangerment, and you may find yourself going to prison. So laws are one of the ways that we govern society. But Lessig makes the case that there's a lot of other ways that we <coughs> govern society. We can use markets to make things cheap or expensive. And you can think of examples of this. Uh, if anyone has the misfortune of being a smoker, Cigarettes have gotten a lot more expensive over the last 20 years. And because people decided societally that smoking was an undesirable <coughs> behavior, cigarettes have been very, very heavily taxed. And right now, it's an extremely expensive habit to have. And that starts putting pressure on people not to smoke. So we can make things cheap if we want people to do them. We can make them expensive if we want people not to do them. But there's other things we can use. We can use social norms. And norms are basically the sort of unwritten rules of society. They govern our behavior. Right now, you guys are doing exactly what people are expected to do during a lecture. Most of you are listening. Most of you are looking at me. If someone else started standing up and giving a rival lecture in the corner, we would think that was pretty strange, <laughs> because that's not in line with our norms. The norms are how we're supposed to behave, and for the most part, we're pretty good about following those social norms. Norms make some behaviors desirable. They make some behaviors undesirable. And it turns out that norms govern a lot of what we do. The fact that people don't smoke has something to do with the fact that cigarettes are expensive. It also has a lot to do with the fact that it was totally normal for every high school student to smoke back in the 1950s. And it's totally abnormal at this point. Where Lessig really made a contribution is he said that sometimes there are technologies, he refers to it as code, but sometimes there are technologies that control what we can do and what we can't do. And the example he gives in the book is that if you put a CD into a computer, the computer says, hey, let me make a copy of that for you. I bet you want some MP3s. Let me rip that for you. If you put in a movie, it says, I cannot copy that for you. Now, there's no difference between the bits. There's no difference between music bits and movie bits, but we have all sorts of laws and structures in place that mean that you can't copy the movie, and therefore the code has restrictions on what you can do and what you can't do. Now, the reason I'm spending all this time talking about Lessig is that I think there's something really interesting that you can do with this idea, which is I think you can turn it inside out. And you can say, any of these different ways that we control society, you can use them as a lever to try to make social change. So sometimes we try to make social change through law. I mentioned that I care a lot about marriage equality. And the folks behind the Human Rights Campaign, and that's their symbol, focused for 20 years on trying to get laws passed and court decisions made that made it possible for gays and lesbians to marry within the United States. And, and finally, in the last year, they had a decision from the Supreme Court that said, no, we're going to treat gay marriage the same way that we're going to treat every other form of marriage. And when you have that legal change, it's great. Everybody has to get in line. You may have heard of this one county court clerk in Kentucky who's refusing to marry people. The only reason you are hearing about this person 
is because everybody else in the United States got in line and decided to follow the law. And that's what's great about law. If you can make change through law, it's really easy, it's really straightforward, but you can't always do it. And so what's interesting is that people are now finding other ways to try to make change on issues where they couldn't otherwise make change. So one of the things I'm unhappiest about in the world right now, one of the things I would most like to change, is the fact that the US government tries to read my email. I spend a lot of time talking to people in other countries. I told you at the beginning of this, I help run a nonprofit organization that has members in 180 countries. And some of those people are involved with different national political movements, and they end up being monitored by the National Security Agency, which means I am monitored by the National Security Agency. And it drives me nuts that my communications are being intercepted and read by the government. And it drives me nuts that a president that I voted for doesn't appear to want to do anything to change NSA behavior in a real significant, lasting way. But there are other things that I can do around this. There's pieces of software like Tor, which is a software system that tries to camouflage and hide what I'm doing online. And it's a system that has some illegal uses and a lot of legal uses that a lot of journalists use, that a lot of dissidents use. And so my friends who are writing this piece of software to try to make communication surveillance resistant, they're trying to change the world, not through passing a law, not through persuading a politician, but through putting new technology, putting new code out in the world. They have a different theory of change. Rather than trying to pass a law, they're trying to invent something new to make change around that subject. I'd like to see the US make some real progress on climate change. Uh, we have not done particularly well in switching away from fossil fuels. But one thing that actually could make an enormous difference is if electric cars became commonplace. <coughs> and instead of driving cars that are doing incomplete combustion of petroleum, you could have electricity, which is usually generated at a much higher rate of efficiency than a car engine runs. And you would have these zero emission vehicles zipping around. And what Elon Musk and the folks behind Tesla have done is said, look, we want these things not only to be available, we want them to be cheap, we want them to be sexy, we want them to be the coolest thing out there on the road. We don't want to have to mandate that people buy electric cars. We want people to want electric cars. And we want to compete in the free market and get to the point where people end up adopting this technology, which has the effect of making major social change, but we didn't have to force them to do it. They chose to do it because it was a desirable thing to do. Where I spend most of my work is on this idea of making change through social norms. And the reason that I work on change through social norms is that I study media, and right now we're at this very weird moment where it's incredibly easy for any of us to make media. You guys may not think you're making media. I would guess that most of you in the last week have taken a photo and you posted it to Facebook, or you posted it to Instagram, or you shared it on Snapchat, or you've done something with it. All of that is actually making media and putting it out in the world. And that media can actually get very deeply involved with making social change. And most of the social change focuses on trying to change perceptions and change norms. So one of the best ways to understand what people do with social change through norms is to think about the Black Lives Matter <coughs> movement. In the wake of Michael Brown's death in Ferguson, the media reached out for a particular image of Michael Brown. They found it on Facebook. And if you look at this image of Michael Brown, he's being shot from below. Any of you who've done photography know that if you shoot someone from below, you'll make them look sort of menacing, you make them look taller, you make them look bigger. So he looks quite old. He looks like he might be in his 20s. He's showing a hand signal. It's a peace sign. Lots of people interpret it as a gang sign. His face is somewhat shadowed. He looks like a threatening dude. This same photo is also of Michael Brown. It's from the same year. It's from the same Facebook feed. And he looks really different. He looks like a cute kid. He looks really approachable. He looks really friendly, maybe a little bit shy. He just looks like a different guy. And what people started asking on social media was, why did they use that picture and not that picture? 
And the implicit message is they use that picture because that guy looks dangerous. And that guy doesn't look dangerous. He looks like someone that I would feel bad that the police had killed. And people started to ask the question, if they gun me down, what picture would they use? And so you saw other African Americans coming up and going onto their Facebook feed and looking for a pair of images. So this is an active duty Marine who basically says, look, on my same Facebook feed, you can find me in dress uniform, and I am the image of what's best and most celebrated about America, and you can find me giving you the finger. And if I got killed, how would you choose to portray me? What image would you use? Thousands and thousands of people participated in this. They jumped into it. They started putting up tweets. They started putting up Tumblr posts. You can see from this Tumblr post and the last one, a lot of people jumped into it probably not for the right reason. They thought it would be really funny to show themselves drunk and out of control and also sort of buttoned down. And then people came back and said, guys, this is actually a discussion of racism. Let's, let's do this in a serious way. Three days after this started, the New York Times picked this up, ran an article about it, and this article was very, very influential for the press. You have a very hard time finding that first image of Michael Brown. It just doesn't show up in the media because people realized that what was happening was the press was helping contribute to a norm. And the norm was that we as Americans tend to see African-American males, particularly young African-American males, as dangerous. And this is a really harmful norm. This is a norm that helps explain why 14-year-old Tamir Rice got shot when he was playing with a toy gun in a park. Because a police officer pulled up in a car and in seconds made a decision to shoot a 14-year-old kid because he saw him as older and he saw him as threatening. And passing a law that tells police that they're not allowed to shoot children isn't going to help because that's been illegal for a long, long, long time. You have to change perceptions. You have to change those norms. So this is the question that I work on right now. I work on this question of how do you help people feel powerful? How do you help people feel like they can make change in society? With the group of sophomores that I talked with this morning, we talked about what you might do as a billionaire. If you had unlimited amounts of money, how would you spend it? How would you try to change the world? But the really interesting question is when you're not a billionaire, when you're a high school student, when you're just a kid, but you're just a kid who lives at a time where you can make media and put it out in the world. You're someone who is a consumer and you can decide what you're buying or not buying. Pretty soon you're gonna be a voter and you can decide who you wanna support, who you don't wanna support. We all have the ability to figure out how to make change and the question is, how do we do it in a way that we feel the most powerful? I'm spending a lot of time right now thinking about this idea of when it's powerful to watch. When one of the most powerful things you can do is watch over these systems that a lot of us mistrust. This is a photo of the Black Panthers, incredibly fascinating social movement near the end of the civil rights movement. Really ugly story ended up being undermined uh, by the US intelligence establishment, ended up as a movement that became fairly violent but what was really interesting about the Black Panthers very early on is the first thing they were focused on was police violence in Oakland, California. They felt like the police in Oakland were being very, very harsh on people of color that they pulled over. And so the Panthers did something that sounds just flat out crazy. Four young guys would get into a car, they would be wearing the leather jackets and the berets, they would have guns because California gun laws at that point allowed them open carry. They would follow around the police. And when the police would stop and make an arrest, four Black Panthers would get out of the car and stand with guns and watch the police make an arrest. This actually led to the NRA. The NRA, actually before it was a pro-gun organization, was actually an anti-gun organization. It actually wanted to stop groups like the Black Panthers from openly carrying weapons, and as they saw it, intimidating the police. But this idea of trying to have oversight over something like the police is a really interesting and really powerful <coughs> thing to do. 
And you see this right now. Right now, the only reason we know about Walter Scott being shot in South Carolina was because Fabian Santana had a mobile phone, turned it on, took a video of what happened. And you now have groups like Copwatch that are going and training people on when it is and when it isn't legal to use your mobile phone to monitor the police. And what I'm not saying from this is that you should go out and start monitoring the police. I suspect that's a fairly dangerous thing for most of you to be doing as, as you know, 15 or 16 year olds. But I do think there's a ton that can be done through this lens of looking at the powerful institutions of, in your life and saying, what are they doing well or poorly? This is work that my lab and I are doing right now in Brazil. This is all in Sao Paulo. And Sao Paulo is, is, is actually the largest city in this hemisphere. It's an absolutely enormous city. It's a very poor city, but it's also a really tech savvy city. People have mobile phones. Almost everybody has a smartphone. And so we built an application. The application says, what do you care about in your community? What's messed up in your community? People in this group said, the sidewalks are messed up. We trip, you know, you can't roll a bike on it, people in wheelchairs, elderly people. And so with our help, they designed an application for their mobile phone where they could go out and collect data. And they go out and collect data and they build maps and they bring them to the city. And armed with those maps, they say, guys, you're not doing a very good job. Here are places where you're falling down in your job. And unless you can show us that you make progress on the issues that we care about, we're going to vote you out of power. So here are our demands. They're really straightforward. They're well documented. We have a data set behind it. And we're watching you. And that power of we're watching you turns out to be incredibly important. And what we're seeing in Sao Paulo is in many cases, neighborhoods that have been neglected for years are getting real attention based on that message that we're watching. So this is what I want to leave you with. I want to leave you with this idea that it's OK to be frustrated by politics. And it's OK to be frustrated by these endless debates heading into the 2016 election. And I'm going to say something that's going to piss off some people in this room. It's OK not to vote. What's not OK is to drop out of civics. What's not OK is to stop trying to make change. What's not OK is disengaging in whatever fashion it is. If you feel like politics, if you feel like passing laws and electing people is a great way to make change and that's a powerful thing for you, do it. Do it well. Get into it. It's a noble thing to do. If you don't feel that way, figure out how to make change some other way. Figure out whether it's making new technologies. Figure out whether it's influencing people through social media campaigns. Figure out whether it's starting a business or starting a boycott. Figure out some way that you can have power as a citizen. This is a moment where there's a lot of mistrust. And what we've got to figure out is not necessarily how to get rid of it, but how do we harness it? How do we take that skepticism? How do we take that frustration? How do we turn it into a positive force? So that's what I'm working on. And I, I put that up because I'd love to talk to you about this. And whether it's here in this room, or whether it's over lunch, or whether you want to drop me an email, or tweet at me, or something like that, this is what I work on. This is what I'm thinking about. And I love coming out to groups like this to talk about it, because I always get new ideas out of it. So thank you very much for listening.